Um, once again, good morning and thank you for joining us today um, for our compliance webinar. My name is Rose Lopes, Senior Partner here at the Sylvia Group. I also manage our Financial Services Employee Benefits Division. Um, we're going to give our late arrivals another minute to log in before I introduce today's guest speaker, but while we do that, I'm going to address a few quick housekeeping items. One is this webinar is being recorded. After we have the downloaded um, recording, we'll send you an email with a link in case you want to review it, anything. If you have any questions during the presentation, I'm asking that you please click on the Q&A icon on the bottom of the screen versus the chat feature to ask your questions. We're going to try to get to as many questions as we can at the end of the webinar, but should we run out of time to answer those questions, we'll be sure to get everything together and send it to you along with the recording. I'm looking at our participants, and it seems like most of our registrants have logged in, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce our guest speaker. Stacy Barrow is one of the country's leading experts on the Affordable Care Act, and his firm, Marathis Barrow Weatherhead Lent LLP, is nationally known for its expertise on paid family and medical leave, as well as employee benefits in general. A graduate of Brandeis University and Hofstra University School of Law, he co-founded Marathis Barrow Weatherhead Lent in 2015. Stacy has extensive technical knowledge and expertise designing and implementing health and welfare plans that meet the numerous and intricate requirements of applicable federal and state law. That knowledge and expertise have made him a sought after speaker and author on issues related to the health to ACA. If you've taken part in one of our Alara Group webinars um, on benefits law, you've probably witnessed how effective Stacy is at explaining some of our pretty complicated topics, and you all know that compliance is pretty um, complicated. So with that being said, I'm going to turn it over to Stacy. All right, well, thanks everybody for joining. This is Stacy Barrow, Marathis Barrow, Weather Headland, and we are proud to partner with the Sylvia Group to offer today's webinar. Uh, we do have uh, a fair amount to cover. We're going to start off with an uh, uh, update on increased um, high deductible plan and ACA limits for next year. We'll talk about a couple of recent Supreme Court cases, some changes to wellness plan rules that we expect to uh, be released next year, how to deal with medical loss ratio rebates and other uh, carrier credits or refunds you may be seeing due to COVID-19. We'll also talk about the uh, Families First Coronavirus Response Act, um, which contains those two paid leave provisions, um, a challenge to that law in New York and the Department of Labor's response to that challenge. And then we'll end with some uh, paid family and medical leave updates for Massachusetts. And um, as Rose said, please, uh, feel free to pose questions um, as we go along, and we'll get to them at the end. Let's go to the next slide. So just a reminder here on the increases to high deductible plan um, and health savings account limits uh, for 2021. Um, they've gone up a little bit in terms of the annual HSA uh, contribution limit. The, um, the uh, deductibles remain the same, which is good news. Um, another reminder, uh, if you have an embedded deductible um, in your high deductible plan, um, you, that must be at least $2,800 um, in order to be HSA qualified. Um, separately, we also have the Affordable Care Act out-of-pocket limits. Um, they also um, apply to all group health plans and under the ACA, all uh, family plans must have an embedded individual out-of-pocket limit. Um, so we'll go to the next slide, and I'll give a quick example of, of how these rules um, interact. And again, if you have um, an embedded deductible, not all plans have them, but some plans will allow um, participants to uh, satisfy the uh, portion of the full family deductible um, is called an embedded deductible, and if you have that feature, it must be at least $2,800. Um, likewise, we have two out-of-pocket limit rules, uh, one for HSAs and one for um, all group health plans. Um, the ACA rule requires an embedded individual out-of-pocket limit that doesn't exceed $8,150. Um, 
So if you have a high deductible plan, um, you can have family um, uh, out of pocket limits greater than 8150, but they must have um, uh, be limited to 8150 for any single participant. Um, I know these parts are this, these rules are a little bit confusing. If you do have any questions on them, um, we can take them at the end and you can always let uh, Ben or Rose know as well. Let's uh, go on and, and talk about um, some of the Supreme Court cases. So um, there have been two uh, recent uh, Supreme Court decisions over the summer that have an impact on employers um, and to, to some extent employee benefit plans. Um, the first one is Bostock versus Clayton County, Georgia. And this is a uh, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act case, and it was a lawsuit. Um, the facts were that an employee, um, he was a in the child services division of the county of, of Clayton County, Georgia, and he was recovering from surgery, and he sought to join a, a sport, a baseball league, um, and it was a, a a gay baseball league, and. Um, to kind of help with some physical therapy and recover from surgery and his work found out about it and he was actually fired because of it. Um, and over the years has been kind of a, a patchwork of decisions uh, among the lower courts. Some courts uh, view sexual orientation as part of sex discrimination for purposes of Title VII and other courts took a more strict view and they said, you know, look, um, the original intent of Title VII when it comes to sex discrimination was more along the lines of discriminating male versus female. It wasn't really intended to cover things like sexual orientation or gender identity. Um, and so due to this disparity between the circuits, the Supreme Court heard the case um, earlier this year in, in Bostock versus Clayton County. Let's go to the next slide. So, you know, again, while it was pretty clear that back in 1964, when the Civil Rights Act was being passed, the focus was largely on race, uh, that the introduction of the term sex to Title VII really referred specifically just to differences between men and women, and that it didn't really um, apply to um, discrimination based on sexual orientation or gender identity. Um, and the opinion is actually authored by um, Neil Gorsuch, and you know, the, the court found that it was impossible to discriminate against someone uh, for being gay or transgendered without discriminating against that individual based on sex. And so now we have it finally kind of as a settled issue under federal law that if someone is discriminated against based on sexual orientation or general identity, that that is in fact sex discrimination. Um, and this decision was a six to three decision. Um, so what does this mean for employers and the group health plans? Um, So we do see this as uh, something that you should be aware of, particularly if you have a self-insured group health plan, uh, self-insured group health plan. Um, we find that um, if a plan has a, a blanket exclusion, just simply excludes coverage for services like gender identity disorder or gender dysphoria, um, that in light of this decision, those exclusions could be subject to challenge under Title VII. It doesn't mean that the, the, the holding didn't provide that every plan has to cover benefits for gender identity disorder um, or these types of services, but a blanket exclusion when a plan covers all other items and services would be um, probably the rebuttable presumption that it was discriminatory. So um, we do uh, recommend just kind of taking that into account when you review your plan designs for next year, particularly if you're self-insured. It's probably not much of an issue um, in, in Massachusetts, in New England, but we do find um, across the country, a lot of plans do contain um, exclusions for those types of, of coverages. 
so um, a couple of days before the uh, decision in Bostock, the Trump administration released of uh, final regulations on Section 1557. Um, this is a, a part of the Affordable Care Act that prohibits discrimination in health programs or activities. Um, under the Obama administration rule, this rule was drafted very broadly to cover um, you know, all different types of, of group health plans um, that really didn't quite directly receive the, the federal funding from HHS. Um, and the Trump administration uh, crafted this final rule that scales back uh, what is considered a covered entity under the law. And the, this rule actually makes a lot more sense and it, it limits being a covered entity to uh, companies or entities that receive federal financial assistance and they're principally engaged in the business of providing health care. Um, and so what this means is that um, there are fewer plans that are subject to Section 1557, and the Trump administration also scaled back some of the um, documentary requirements that also uh, were associated uh, with, this, with these regulations. Um, so they removed the tagline requirements um, which were were fairly burdensome. Um, they were um, can, they were expected to cost somewhere you know tens of billions of dollars for all the plans subject to these rules to incorporate them into the plan. You probably saw them over the last couple of years. Um, they were a page or two of um, these taglines that were in about 20 or 30 different languages that would just basically say that the plan does not discriminate on the basis of race, race age, sex, national origin, disability, um, and so on. So I think that those changes do make a lot more sense. Um, and then one other thing that the Trump administration rule um, changed was it eliminated protections um, for um, gender identity disorder, gender dysphoria. Um, however, in light of the Bostock case, those, that rule is already challenged and then a court in New York vacated that part of the final rule. So we do kind of retain the Obama era definition on, um, uh, on sex discrimination, including things like gender identity and sexual orientation. So consistent with the, the case uh, or the decision in Bostock. Let's move on. This is another uh, Supreme Court case. It's um, kind of interesting. It's involving um, the ACA recommended preventive care um, for women, particularly the contraceptive coverage requirement. And when the Affordable Care Act was passed in 2010, it required that all group health plans provide certain preventive care and screenings. Um, and that term, isn't exactly described or defined in the law. Um, it's rather delegated to Health and Human Services to determine by rulemaking. So back in 2010, when the ACA was passed, it didn't include um, the requirement to provide contraceptive coverage. That came along in 2012. Um, the um, HRSA, the agency that's in charge of making these guidelines, um, added contraceptive coverage to the list. And those rules were immediately challenged by religious institutions around the country who had a religious objection to providing contraceptive coverage. So under the Obama administration, um, Health and Human Services uh, granted these uh, accommodations to religious employers and certain groups that weren't like churches, but they still had a religious aspect of their, um, of their company. Um, and they were allowed to self-certify that they were not going to provide contraceptive coverage. And then the carrier or carrier or third party administrator would still allow the participants to obtain that coverage that they had a federal right to. 
Um, these rules were also challenged because they they were they didn't go far enough to accommodate the religious employers. And then they were further challenged for failing to provide exemptions for private businesses. Um, and uh, the Trump administration had drafted some regulations that provided for a more expansive religious and a moral objection to the preventive care requirements so that more employers, um, not just those who had a religious aspect to the, the entity itself, but whose owners may be objected to providing contraceptive coverage. So these regulations were also challenged. Um, and let's go to the next slide. And so this case um, found its way in front of the Supreme Court. Um, and it was the first case they heard by phone because of COVID. Um, and in this case, the court it was a seven to two decision and they lifted the injunction against those regulations and remanded the case back to the lower court. And um, it was kind of a, you know, a, it seems like a lopsided decision, right? It's seven to two. And the reason that the court found that the Trump administration regulations um, at, at least could could stand for the time being until reviewed by the lower court is based on this uh, concept called Chevron deference. It's a, a legal principle that uh, kind of stands for the proposition that when you have a law and you have agencies that are tasked with implementing that law, that when the agencies like the IRS or Department of Labor or Health and Human Services, when they draft their regulations, they're kind of presumed to be reasonable unless they're really in conflict with the law. Um, that you're, you know, you're deferring to the, how the, the agency's interpretation of the law um, when they develop their, their regulations. And so when you look at the ACA, you can see that the law itself did provide authority to Health and Human Services to develop guidelines as to what is preventive care. And so um, the court basically said, look, you know, maybe these, these regulations are a little um, unusual, but the, you know, the, the president and his administration, they do have the authority to draft this type of regulation. Um, lower courts could still invalidate these, um, uh, but they will get, the case does kind of get remanded to the lower court. Um, and they'll go through the um, administrative procedures process and, and make sure that um, the, the rules are consistent with the law. There were two dissents. One of them was Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, she had a, I, I'll, I'll try to paraphrase it. I can't quite do it justice, but she, she basically said, you know, look, what about the countervailing rights here of all the people, the women who are entitled to uh, contraceptive coverage under the law. And she said, this is just another example of the court kind of kowtowing to religious sensibilities without taking into account countervailing interests. Um, so she, she did have a couple of, of interesting quotes there. One of the other ones was that, you know, she said, you know, look, you know, 10 years ago or so, um, Congress uh, decided that if a, a woman is gainfully employed, that she has the right to contraceptive coverage, which was an interesting way to put it. And I, I hadn't quite um, heard a phrase like that before, but that was that was part of her dissent. Um, the next piece here, um, uh, we expect there to be some changes to wellness program regulations probably coming out next year. And this is kind of a, a culmination of um, various lawsuits over the years that kind of challenged um, prior EEOC guidance. Um, so if you, you may remember over the years, if you have wellness programs, um, there have been a, a couple of lawsuits where the EEOC challenged um, 
very aggressive wellness programs. The, the had some where the rewards were 100% of the cost of coverage, and, and those tend to be um, situations where the EEOC might, might tend to get more involved. Um, but they had previously drafted regulations that coincided with the Department of Labor's 30% limits on wellness programs, which um, were pretty useful for employers, gave them some certainty um, as to how the Department of Labor and, and EEOC, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, view wellness programs. Um, but those rules were, were challenged, and, and the EEOC actually lost, and its 30% rules were vacated uh, a couple of years ago. Um, one of the issues is that under the Americans with Disabilities Act, which is enforced by the EEOC, um, wellness programs um, generally have to be voluntary due to a requirement under the ADA that any medical exam or disability-related inquiry by an employer on an employee either has to be voluntarily, vol pardon me, voluntary or job-related. Um, so it's kind of a struggle for the EEOC to draft rules that allow for very significant penalties um, for wellness programs. Um, so what we have here is the EEOC um, had a phone call, a public phone call, where they um, advised uh, some of the directions that they're thinking they're going to go um, with new wellness program rules. And so they're thinking of breaking it down into a couple of categories, um, participatory programs and health contingent programs. And they're thinking of limiting the participatory programs to only providing de minimis incentives, um, which under Department of Labor rules, um, there currently is no limit for participatory wellness programs. So things like taking an HRA, getting a biometric screening, getting a physical, um, without any required follow-up, any incentives for those would need to be de minimis. For other types of wellness programs, the kind that have a little more teeth, um, we call them health contingent wellness programs, where you may have to actually um, attain a specific outcome <clears throat> to um, earn a reward or avoid a penalty, they're thinking that they're going to allow a reward of up to 30% of the cost of coverage um, for those types of wellness programs. Um, even this type of rule, though, could also be subject to challenge because of the 30% limit. They're, they're kind of squeezing it in um, under an exemption for certain types of underwriting that the EEOC always claimed actually didn't apply to wellness programs. So it's a, it's a complete 180, and they're, they're treating health contingent wellness programs essentially as a, a form of underwriting in order to make it fit within this, this exception. Um, so the rule itself hasn't been published yet, so we don't really know, you know, any real details, you know, how de minimis will be defined and things like that. And then we do expect that once it is published, it's very likely going to be uh, subject to uh, challenge and, and further scrutiny. So um, employers around the country um, and uh, including New England, we've seen some around here as well, have been receiving credits from insurance carriers due to low, low utilization because of COVID-19 and, and folks really um, staying away from providers in large part and, and not having as, you know, as much elective surgery and those kinds of things, um, as well as receiving medical loss ratio rebates. So um, analyzing these, uh, they're, they're they're kind of you kind of go through the same analysis whether it's a medical loss ratio rebate or other you know dividend or refund or credit from the carrier um, with one nuance and that is with regard to medical loss ratio rebates the participants they are notified by the carriers that the plan is getting a rebate 
So as we go through this and, you know, we talked about ways that the employer can retain the rebate um, just from a, an optic standpoint, some employers choose to share the MLR rebate with employees, even when they might have a basis for attaining it themselves, just because the employees are actually you know, getting a communication in the mail from the carrier advising them that the plan is, is getting a refund. But other than that, um, whenever a plan gets um, money returned to it, um, an ERISA plan, you need to consider whether participants have any right to um, uh, to share in, in those funds. So if the plan is 100% employee paid, um, then, you know, obviously you need to use the funds in a way that complies with the um, exclusive benefit rule in ERISA, either returning those funds to participants or having a premium holiday. But in, in most cases, it'll be an employer and employee split. Um, when it comes to premium contributions. And in most cases, the employer's contribution will be significantly more than the employee's contribution. So um, a lot of times these rebates and refunds and credits can be um, you know, not very significant. And so the employer will say, you know, can't we just kind of retain these rebates um, you know, even though employees contribute to um, the, the cost of coverage, you know, what are the, the rules here? So the first thing we always do is look at the plan document or the, the wrap plan document. Um, they can be drafted to provide that the employer is entitled to all refunds and rebates and credits that are issued under the plan. Um, you can simply, you know, um, drafted into the document. Um, you, you would say that um, the way the plan funds itself is that the premiums are paid first from participant contributions, and then the employer has to uh, fill in any remainder on top of the employee contributions. And so um, if there is any refund or return of premiums, it is necessarily a reduction of the employer's contribution. It's, it's the employer getting its money back because the employee money was already used to pay um, the first part of the premiums. So if you have this type of language in the plan, it provides you a lot more flexibility and you could say, okay, we're, you know, we understand we have the, the right to retain this rebate, um, but we're going to do X, Y, Z with it. We're going to enhance the plan a little bit or do a premium credit, um, or we're going to say, well, look, we kept coverage in place for everybody during COVID for three months when no one was working. And, and so we're going to kind of reimburse ourselves. Um, if you have that flexibility in the plan document, um, it's, it's easier to support. If you don't have any helpful language in the plan, then um, you may need to share the refund or rebate or credit with employees uh, proportionate to their contributions. Um, so if you don't have that helpful language, um, you either need to share the refund with participants or take that approach that I described where you know, if, if you do in fact charge employees a fixed contribution, um, that you're taking the position that the employer is filling in the remainder, and so any refund should be returned to the employer. Um, but again, it's, it, is, it is a better approach to have that language baked into um, your plan document. So now for the, the latter half of the webinar, so I'm going to focus on um, the COVID-19 related issues and responses and lawsuits um, and other, other things um, offered by um, the federal government um, as relates to COVID-19. So one of the first couple of major relief bills was the FFCRA, and it includes two paid leave provisions that apply um, through the end of this year, unless it's extended. Um, these paid sick leave rules apply to employers with less than 500 employees and public employers of any size. So most employers out there are going to be subject um, to these rules. And if you 
you have more than 500 employees, you very likely already provide um, a, a paid leave uh, program. And um, there's real good guidance out there from the Department of Labor and the IRS. They continue to uh, update these FAQs on a regular basis. I'll go through some of the more recent updates um, in a couple of minutes. Um, we wanted to link them here. Um, and, and of course, we'll share these after the, the presentation if we haven't already, um, but they're, they're helpful FAQs there. So when you have to provide this leave as an employer, it is paid for by the federal government. Um, the employer is eligible for a full tax credit uh, for the amount of the paid leave and the health insurance premiums that the employer is required to continue while an, an employee is out on this paid leave. So um, I, ideally, it should be revenue neutral um, for the employer. Unless you're a public employer, they actually don't get the tax and credit, the, the tax credits. So a, a state or local governmental employer would still be subject to the law, but they don't get the corresponding tax credits. So there are two types of paid sick leave um, under the FFCRA. There's the emergency paid sick leave and there's expanded FMLA. They total 12 weeks. The first two weeks or 80 hours is paid by paid sick leave. And then the latter 10 weeks, if someone's eligible for it, is paid under the expanded FMLA. Um, this allows an employee to be paid up to $511 per day when caring for themselves um, and then paid at two thirds of their regular rate up to $200 per day um, when leave is taken to care for others. Um, let's go to the next slide. So this is the first piece of the paid leave, and it's intended to be used before the emergency FMLA, which is much more limited um, and really is only available for number five here. Um, but for emergency paid sick leave, for 80 hours of paid sick leave, um, an employee has five different triggers that will allow him to take off work and, and, and get a payment. The sixth one down there is kind of the player to be named later um, that um, is not um, active at the moment. So we're really just concerned with one through five. Um, so in order to be eligible for paid sick leave, the employee must be unable to work or work remotely um, because the employee is subject to a federal, state, or local quarantine or isolation order related to COVID-19. They've been told to self-quarantine um, due to COVID-19 concerns. Perhaps they're presumptive positive um, or they uh, have a lot of risk factors. They're particularly vulnerable to COVID-19. That's another payment trigger. The third one is that um, they have symptoms and they're seeking the diagnosis. And then four and five are caring for others who may need assistance. Like we have caring for someone who is subject to a quarantine or isolation order. And then number five, caring for a child whose school is closed or whose regular daycare provider is unavailable due to COVID-19. So those are the five um, paid sick leave uh, triggers uh, that can allow an employee to take off. So once the 80 hours are used, there's the possibility that an employee can get an additional 10 weeks of leave for a total of 12 weeks of paid leave um, for um, a situation where the employee can't work because the, they need to care for a child whose school or place of care is closed or unavailable due to COVID-19. So this is the only payment trigger under expanded FMLA, it has to do with caring for a child um, who has to stay home from school or from daycare. Um, generally, the, 
This is for minor children under age 15, unless special circumstances exist requiring the need for the employee to care for the child during daylight hours. So after the 10-day elimination period, which is paid under the paid sick leave uh, provision, the rest of this leave is paid at two-thirds of the employee's regular rate. They are capped at $200 per day. So essentially, it's a 10-week continuation of reason number five of the emergency paid sick leave. Um, there are a couple of, of nuances. Um, when you have an employee on the emergency paid sick leave, they uh, cannot be required to supplement those first 80 hours with paid leave. You can allow them to do so, but you can't require them to do so. After the elimination period, once the expanded FMLA applies, you may, as an employer, require employees to take paid leave concurrent with the FMLA. So um, even if they're, they're getting their, their full pay under EFMLA, you can also burn their PTO time along with it. Um, which is consistent with how traditional FMLA works. It does run concurrent with, uh, with PTO. There is an exception um, for small employers from under the um, paid sick leave and EFMLA provisions, but it's very narrow on a couple of levels. One, it's only available if you're under 50 employees and providing the leave would jeopardize the viability of the business as a going concern. And um, the only exemption is when leave is being taken to care for a child whose school or place of care is closed due to COVID-19. If the employee um, is under a quarantine order or has been advised to quarantine uh, by a doctor or they're caring for someone who's vulnerable to COVID-19, then these exemptions for small employers uh, do not apply. So one of the uh, clarifications that the Department of Labor uh, prescribed in their regulations, and it makes a lot of sense, and it's called the work availability requirement. And so, um, the way the rule works is that an employee is not eligible to take paid sick leave or emergency FMLA if the company is closed. Um, if the work site is, is not currently active, there is no work available for the employee, um, the employee is furloughed, um, or their hours are reduced. If the company just says we're, we're kind of losing business, we need to reduce everyone everyone's hours temporarily, you can't fill in the remainder with paid sick leave. It's, and it's referred to as the work availability requirement. Um, in, in other words, the employer must have work available for the employee to do in order for the employee to qualify for leave. The employee has to be unable to perform that work due to a COVID-19 qualifying reason. And so this would be the case, even if the work site was required to close because of a, a, a quarantine order. Um, the Department of Labor suggests that these employees would, better, would be better suited to pursue unemployment. Um, you, know, you can see obviously if they're, if they're furloughed, you know, that would make more sense. A lot of states provided for uh, partial unemployment um, for reductions in hours. And so this rule kind of made a lot of sense. It was later challenged um, successfully by New York. And so I'll, I'll talk about that um, in a second or two. Um, there are substantiation requirements in order to qualify for these tax credits. So employers want to be careful um, that um, you know when they're granting the leave that they do get substantiation from the employee. It's not all that rigorous. You just need the employee's name, the dates for which leave is requested, um, the COVID-19 qualifying reason, and then um, a statement from the employee that they can't work, including work remotely um, for that COVID-19 qualifying reason. You know, the employer might allow for remote work, but the employee might say, I'm too sick to work, or 
um, you know, caring for the child um, while the child is home. Um, remote learning is just not a conducive environment. I can't work during that time. Um, and, uh, you know, that may indeed be a qualifying reason. Um, if the leave is based on a quarantine order or advice, um, the employee just needs to either provide the name of the governmental entity ordering the quarantine, or if it's recommended by a doctor, the name of the doctor. Um, you, they don't need a doctor's note. Um, and if the individual is caring for someone else, um, who they're caring for in relation to the employee. So the employer can do their, their diligence, um, make sure that um, the employee is at least representing that they have a doctor who's advised self-quarantine and, and that doctor's name. But again, um, they, the IRS does not want you requiring a doctor's note as part of the substantiation. Um, if the leave is due to a school closing or provider unavailability, it's the name of the child, the name of the school or daycare provider, um, a statement from the employee that no one else, other suitable person is available to care for the child. You know, generally, if another parent is available, um, then um, you know, leave um, is not uh, available for the employee. And if the employee needs to leave to care for a child older than 14, a statement that special circumstances exist. So in light of the school's um, reopening or opening partially or opening temporarily, uh, the Department of Labor updated their FAQs uh, to provide guidance on certain scenarios involving school closures. So if you, if your school, your child's school requires hybrid learning where some days they're in school and some days they're home, the employee is allowed to take leave for days that the child is home and the employee has to be there while the child is learning remotely. The school is effectively closed to the child on remote learning days, and so the employee can qualify for leave there. Um, again, if there's no other parent available um, and the employee um, you know, is not uh, agreeing with the employer to, to work um, intermittently and kind of work earlier or later and, and still get the work done. In those situations, they're not eligible for leave during the daytime because they're still making arrangements with the employer to, um, to get the work done. So it's only, um, you know, really when the, the work is not being performed can the employee possibly um, uh, be eligible for payment. If the employee can choose in-person or remote learning for the child, then they can't take any uh, paid leave if they choose remote learning. So um, unfortunately, if there's an option, um, they, they have to send the, the child to school. Um, if the school is starting with remote learning, but it might move to in-person depending on how things progress, the employees may be entitled to the paid leave while the school remains closed. Again, if they otherwise qualify and substantiate leave and there's no one else available to care for the child, then um, the employee can um, qualify for that paid leave for, for up to 12 weeks. So um, in Manhattan and Brooklyn, uh, which is in part of the Southern District of New York, they were obviously very uh, hard hit by COVID-19. And th the state of New York felt that the Department of Labor's regulation was a little too employer friendly and protected employers a bit too much and was inconsistent with the, uh, with the statute, with the FFCRA. And um, a federal judge in New York vacated four pieces of the Department of Labor regulation. Um, that ruling is generally effective just in the Southern District of New York. Um, if you're in you know, upstate, greater New York, um, Long Island, you should also um, take notice of this ruling. 
the Department of Labor has responded, though, and um, largely kind of maintained their existing provision, uh, position, although they did um, water the rule down a little bit and make it a little bit less employer friendly. So the first issue that New York had was that they felt the health care provider exemption was way too broad. Um, under the exemption, anyone who worked for a health care provider or even contracted with a health care provider, any of those employees could be exempted from the law, meaning you could deny paid leave to any of those employees under the health care provider exemption. And the the Department of Labor responded to that by narrowing that definition a little bit. And they said, okay, you know, we, we get it. The exemption is really meant more for people who are really more directly involved in providing care, you know, extending to people who might interpret laboratory results. You know, they're, they're kind of indirectly related to care. But they did say that other people, um, other employees, their positions are far too attenuated to be considered healthcare providers. Like if you are in the IT department of a hospital or the physical plant and the janitorial folks, um, you know, that's, that's too attenuated and you cannot deny leave to someone in IT if they you know, need, need to, uh, to, to take the paid leave. So that, that kind of makes sense. That, that, that um, exemption was very broad. Um, and surprising in the initial regulation. The other issue that New York had was with the work availability requirement. And New York said, look, this is this rule that you have work available for the employee actually isn't in the law. And so, you know, look, even if you are furloughing employees and laying them off, they should still be eligible for paid sick leave and the employer should have to go through the, um, you know, the, the steps of obtaining the credit and the Department of Labor disagreed there and they said that, you know, they, they continue to maintain that the employer must have work available for the employee in order to qualify for paid leave, which kind of makes sense. Um, the judge also vacated the requirement that employees obtain consent for intermittent leave, but the Department of Labor, you know, they continue to kind of reaffirm that decision, they require employees to obtain consent, and they also are only allowing intermittent leave for expanded FMLA purposes. In other words, if you're quarantining because you um, have COVID, you can't quarantine in the morning and come in in the afternoon. Um, so you, you can't um, work intermittently unless it's remote or it's for um, EFMLA purposes. Um, let's, uh, let's move on. So Congress did adjourn for the summer without passing any additional COVID-19 related relief. There were a couple of uh, very large spending bills on the table, one, two, three trillion dollar bills, uh, the HEROES Act and the HEALS Act. Um, they would have contained a number of provisions relevant to group health plans like expanded or, or subsidized COBRA coverage, more relief for health FSAs. But at this point, it seems really unlikely we're going to get any additional relief um, before the end of the year. Um, that would include for FSAs and group health plans. We have seen some executive orders issued by the president where he's offered a FICA deferral. Um, we are not seeing too many employers uh, take the administration up on that offer. It's administratively burdensome, and it is only a deferral. Um, and so I think some employers might anticipate having some difficulty um, if employees were to leave employment. The employer would be responsible for filling in the difference. And um, anyone who avails themselves of this, the employees would have a lower paycheck in the first quarter of 2021. The president did say that he would seek to make it permanent if reelected, um, but I think that would require an act of Congress, so it might be um, difficult to, to make that happen. Okay. Um, so the next piece here, um, 
want to give a, a quick update on paid family and medical leave in Massachusetts. This is a, a relatively new uh, requirement in Massachusetts, applies to all employers um, and uh, even certain uh, independent contractors. Um, there are elements of this law that allow former employees who have been uh, separated from employment for less than 26 weeks to retain eligibility for um, paid family and medical leave from their prior employer. Next slide here. So the contribution schedule is 0.75% of qualifying earnings. So basically for every $100 um, they earn up to the limit, there's a 75 cent contribution. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, so that that 75 or 0.75 percent payroll deduction breaks down into two components: one for family leave and one for medical leave. The medical leave piece is split employer and employee 60/40, and the family leave piece is paid 100 percent by the individual. Of course, the employer is free to be more generous, but these are the minimum requirements under the law. Click through this. So the contributions are limited to uh, qualifying earnings, which are basically um, up to the Social Security limit. And click one more ahead here. Um, and there is an exception if you're less than 25 employees, you're not required to pay um, the employer's share of contributions. Um, there's also the ability to exempt yourself um, from this requirement by offering a private plan as an employer if you provide benefits that are at least um, as generous as those required under the law. All of this is done um, largely through the Mass Tax Connect system. It's it's basically kind of automated. Um, it's it's um, kind of keyed to unemployment, and the um, department then uh, will calculate the total quarterly contribution owed by the employer, and you, you pay all that um, online unless you're doing the um, private plan. Um, so the benefits um, generally become effective on 1-1. Um, and there are some various um, uh, triggers that apply, caring for a sick family member, bonding with a newborn, um, bonding with a child, um, managing family affairs when a family member is on active duty, um, managing your own personal serious um, injury or illness, and um, this, these all combine for an absolute total of um, about 26 weeks. So recently, Massachusetts did amend their regulations to um, provide a little more clarity here. Um, one piece is that employees with substance use disorders, they may qualify for leave. Um, if you have a private plan, it must contain an internal appeals process and um, the private plan then has to at least be as rich as what the law requires and it must apply to the entire covered workforce in Massachusetts. You can't have a private plan for only part of your employee group. Um, employees who use paid leave generally will not be eligible um, for the paid family leave benefits through the state while they're using any accrued leave um, from their employer. Um, employees can continue to access paid family medical leave um, for up to 26 months after termination, although if the employee is rehired somewhere else, then they file with their new employer. 
on that, I think, was a, a helpful clarification there. Um, and employees must provide 30 days advance notice when possible. And there are very strong uh, anti-retaliation provisions in the regulations that prohibit a negative change in employment after an employee takes this leave, although um, it does not include trivial or subjectively perceived inconveniences. So slight changes um, should not be considered retaliation. Okay, so we've made it through uh, my prepared slides. I know that was probably a fair amount of content um, for an hour. Um, happy to open it up to any questions or thoughts or comments. Yeah, so Stacy, this is Rose. Um, question for you. You mentioned that um, there may not be any upcoming changes to the FSA laws, and I'm assuming that that also includes um, dependent care. We've had certain instances where some of our employer groups allowed employees to suspend their dependent care um, contributions in light of COVID due to the new rules. And now those employees have funds that are sitting out there. Um, the question is, at some point between now and the end of the year, would those employers be able to refund those employees if those daycares haven't opened? Um, so there's not really a mechanism to refund them on a dollar for dollar basis to just simply say, okay, you have $650 left. Here's your check. Other employee has 500 left. Here's your check. But there is a mechanism to return to employees um, what are referred to as experience gains under the plan. So at the end of the year, after paying claims and all administrative expenses, the employer may have a, a pot of money sitting um, at the, remaining at the end of the year. It's called an experience gain. Typically, what happens with experience gains is they're usually, you know, not too significant, and the employer will roll them over from year to year and use them to defray ex ex administrative expenses in future years. You don't often see refunds under health or dependent care FSA is at the end of the year, right? That's, that's usually too common. Yeah. However, the employer could decide, though, to share that experience gain with employees. The, the, um, the kind of the catch is that you can't do it based on utilization. You can't say, again, you know, well, employee A had 650 left, employee B had 500 left, so that's you get your share, you get your share but you can base it on the election amount. So if you and I each elected $2,500 and I used all mine and you forfeited all of yours, we would still be entitled to the same rebate because our election amounts were the same, but it's still a, a good way to get some money back to participants. And I would suspect that in many cases, you may find a lot of employees are in the same boat where you know many of them weren't able to use their elections at all. Um, and so they'd all be forfeiting a, a very similar percentage of their elected amount. And so the money they get back would, would maybe approximate what they forfeited. Um, you do need to wait until the end of the year, but that's how you would do it under um, a a fully compliant approach. You'd wait till you found your experience gain, and then you would allocate it back to employees based on their election amounts. Okay. I also see something here that says um, employees who use paid paid leave may access um, the paid family medical leave within 26 months of termination, but the slide says 26 weeks. So it is 26 weeks, correct? Yeah, sorry about that. Okay. Yes, from yeah. this week. Confirm. We're not that with, crazy in Massachusetts. Yeah. And with that, I don't have any other questions. You know, I'd like to uh, thank everyone for joining us today. Once again, um, this presentation is being recorded, and we will be able to um, send this out to everyone along with any additional questions that we get after the uh, webinar. So thank you.